How does the American economy look to you? Lousy. Very lousy. Do you think it's going to get better or worse? I hope we'll get better, and I think we'll get better. It, it's supposed to get better. I read about signs of recovery, but I haven't personally seen any. I thought it would be a little easier by now. I did. How's business? Next on Listening to America, Curing the Economy. See it here on Iowa Public Television, Tuesday evening at 9. The next new and live Mark Russell comedy special is coming up on public television. But these are serious times. Everybody is mad about something. In New York City, they trashed a neighborhood bar for having happy hour. In L.A., they put a chokehold on a guy for wearing a smile button. The song Happy Days Are Here Again has been banned for its objectionable lyrics. But if I took everything as seriously as everybody else, I could get sued for malpractice. Wednesday at 7 here on Iowa Public Television. Coming soon, a bold new approach to coverage of this year's political conventions on public television. For the first time, PBS and NBC join forces to provide in-depth primetime coverage. With expert reporting and analysis of the parties, the candidates, and the issues. We'll offer live coverage each evening as together we clarify the issues shaping this election year. PBS Election 92. Unconventional convention coverage. Coming soon. Enjoy TV worth watching on statewide Iowa Public Television, a resource for Iowa's future. More than 100 world leaders gathered in Rio for the world's first Earth Summit, a giant meeting to discuss global warming, biodiversity, and the world's environmental future. Have we really reached the limits of growth for planet Earth? A look at the world economy after the Earth Summit with Lawrence Summers, chief economist of the World Bank. Any attempt to suddenly ramp down emissions would have enormous costs for the global economy. From Washington, this is American Interests. In a moment, we'll talk with Lawrence Summers, chief economist for the World Bank and professor of political economy at Harvard University. We'll also hear from Maurice Strong, secretary general of the Earth Conference, Peter Thatcher of the World Resources Institute, and Alan Murray of the Wall Street Journal. Major funding for American interests is provided by Maytag Corporation, a family of companies continuing the quality tradition in home appliances and vending products throughout the world. The Earth Summit in Rio has catapulted global warming biodiversity and environmental concerns to the very top of the international agenda. Billed as the largest gathering of heads of state in history, the Earth Summit and its organizers hope to influence not only environmental policy, but how the post-Cold War world is organized. Maurice Strong is UN General Secretary for the conference. We have to use the summit to ensure that people around the world realize that we are at a very major point of civilizational change. That we cannot continue on our present economic pathway. We've got to make major shifts in our economic behavior. And if we do, both our economic future and our environmental future can be very promising indeed. Organizers of the Earth Summit hope the outcome of the conference is global consensus in a few key environmental areas. For its part, the U.S. has tried to slow the headlong rush toward a green agenda. A number of other countries uh, hide behind the United States. The United States is still the biggest economy, and many of its OECD partners in Europe and the Far East uh, are, in effect, have been let off the hook by what, from the outside, appears to be an obstruction, obstructionist role 
by the United States. The United States doesn't deserve quite that bad a, a criticism, but some of its friends don't mind talking in the corridors and saying, you know, we're not the problem, it's, it's those Americans who are the problem. A treaty on global warming was to be the centerpiece of the Earth Summit. The original draft proposed reducing greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by the year 2000. In the run-up to the conference, the U.S. managed to push through compromise language that omits specific targets and deadlines. A second global treaty on biodiversity would protect the world's plant and animal species from extinction. In a rerun of the North-South debate of the 1960s and 70s, third world governments are asking developed countries to pay royalties for raw materials taken from outside their national boundaries. This time, genetic materials found in rainforests. The Bush administration refused to sign the treaty, citing its burdensome cost to the world's emerging genetic engineering industry. Perhaps the most important legacy of the Earth Summit will not be a piece of paper, but the creation of a new body called the Sustainable Development Commission, a UN agency charged with monitoring environmental policies of governments around the world. Today, we have come to realize that the very same processes that have produce such wealth and prosperity and power in the industrialized countries have also largely caused tremendous deterioration in the environment and the natural resource base and in the life-supporting ecosystems on which human life itself depends. Uh, and that uh, these endanger the future of all, rich and poor, and that the cooperation of all, rich, poor, east, west, north, and south, is needed as never before to solve these problems. And this means setting up a cooperative regime, a new global partnership to deal with these issues, transcending some of the uh, differences that continue uh, to cause nations to work in counterproductive directions, not only from each other, but in terms of their own environment and economic uh, interests. It's probably not the right solution, but more importantly, it's not going to happen. And the one thing that continues to be true in the post-Cold War world is that the U.S. is the most important and the most powerful nation in the world by far, and the U.S. is simply not going to let any sort of power be transferred to that kind of a sustainable development commission. We'll make it more difficult Lawrence Summers is chief economist of the World Bank, the international agency charged with fostering economic development in third world countries. He is on leave from Harvard University, where he is a professor of political economy. Welcome to American Interests. I'm Morton Kondracki. Larry Summers, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, at the Earth Summit, there seem to be two points of view, worldviews, if you like, expressed. The United States view and everybody else's view. Uh, which side is the World Bank on? World Bank sees the D in UN Conference on Environment and Development for development as being absolutely essential and sees the role of protecting the environment as critical to achieving economic development. That means emphasis on some of the global problems, but even more, it means emphasis on the local problems that have the greatest consequences for real people. In your World Development Report, the World Bank's World Development Report, you go page after page after page and finally you come to a little section about global climate change which suggests to me that of all the things being talked about down at the summit and elsewhere that that global warming is a rather minor uh, problem as far as you're concerned. We devote a sizable part of a chapter to the global warming problem and there's no question that it is a major area of concern. But what needs to be done about it are primarily things that would be good to do even if there were no environmental problems. Getting rid of energy subsidies, concentrating on research on the renewable fuels that will prepare us for a response if the scientific evidence uh, suggests that a major response is necessary. These are what the priorities uh, should be. It's not time for some crash program to collapse carbon emissions overnight. Mm -hmm. But that is what most environmentalists understand to be the meaning uh, of the global warming danger, that we would close down plants, we would stop burning fossil fuels uh, in, in a rush, on a rush basis. Is that a bad idea, for, especially for somebody who's interested in development? Any attempt to suddenly ramp down emissions would have enormous costs for the global economy, costs that would be felt both in developed countries 
and in developing uh, countries. A 1% reduction in GNP growth in the industrialized world means half a percent, nearly half a percent reduction in GNP growth in the developing world, and that means a harder time for the billion people who live on less than a dollar a day. So yes, we should be concerned. Yes, where energy conservation is inexpensive, it should be done. But the scientific evidence as yet does not warrant any kind of crash response to that problem. Mm -hmm. So you think uh, that the Bush administration's position on all this is fundamentally right, that is to resist uh, a treaty which compels uh, timetables and meeting timetables on uh, CO2 emissions? I think a crash response is uncalled for. I think it's difficult to know what the uh, Ex how exactly uh, things should be worked out. Everybody's making a big fuss about whether emissions will remain stable. The truth is that on the projections right now, U.S. carbon emissions are only going to be a couple percent above their 1990 level, even if we don't take the kind of steps the environmentalists are advocating. Mm -hmm. So I think that's more of a close call. What is unambiguous and what is clear is that the kind of crash response that many people are proposing is not the right way to go. But, but I gather the answer is yes. You do think that the Bush administration has it fundamentally right. The Bush administration, the many scientists around the world who are saying that we shouldn't be afraid of technology, we shouldn't be afraid of energy use, we should conserve, but not uh, go too far in achieving that, do have it, uh, do have it right. On the details of uh, the treaty, that can be argued, uh, the current treaty, that can be argued either ways. Certainly some of the proposals early on in this process for precipitous action would have been going much too far. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let me just ask you to take off your hat as, uh, as a World Bank economist and return to the uh, Harvard economist uh, position and also sometime advisor to the Democratic Party in the United States. Most of the Democratic candidates and many members of Congress are all for fast uh, diminution of CO2 emissions. Do they not understand wh what the needs of the world are, or how do you explain their dedication to this uh, environmentalist agenda? I can't uh, explain other people's uh, motives. I can only say that as we at the World Bank and others have looked at the evidence, it suggests a real cause for concern, but that even the most alarmist projections about the consequences of global warming do not suggest that it would have a consequence 60 or 100 years from now that's greater than the current recession that we're experiencing in the economy right now. And that means that taking emergency catastrophic action right now is just not the right thing uh, to do. Again, there are things that need to be done, uh, conserving energy in inexpensive ways, doing the research, getting rid of uh, energy subsidies. But those are the things we should be concentrating on, not at all, not, surely not, any agenda of trying to stop growth, mm. which would oh, be catastrophic you, everywhere. So do you think that the environmental movement in the United States, then, is unnecessarily apocalyptic about this problem? There are certainly some uh, spokesmen and certainly some pundits who I think have conjured up a vision of apocalypse that lacks realism and whose policy recommendations, if accepted, would raise the rate of poverty both in the United States um, and in uh, other parts of the world very substantially, mm -hmm. and that that would really be a wrong way uh, to go. Is there a, an, an essential conflict between environmental cleanliness and development? I think that's a myth. I think the evidence suggests much more that development goes along with and makes for greater environmental cleanliness. Look at American cities. They're much cleaner than they were 30 years ago. Look at the capital cities of countries whose average income is $10,000 and compare them with the, with the air in the capital cities of countries whose income is $1,000 and they're considerably uh, cleaner. Look at the amount of sanitary water people drink in rich countries, look in poor countries. The fact is that development makes possible the resources necessary to improve the environment, and it makes perfect sense that as people get richer, they're more willing to pay for environmental protection. I think speeding development, spurring development, is the best thing that can be done 
to protect uh, the environment and the kind of Luddite limits to growth uh, view is a very, very dangerous one. The apocalyptic view that we're going to encounter some threshold of uh, some threshold that we're going to have some kind of Malthusian uh, catastrophe as we look at the record, uh, there's really no evidence uh, to support that. People were saying in New York in the 1880s that there was going to be more horse manure uh, produced and it was going to be 10 feet high and nobody was going to be able to get from place to place. People said in the 1940s that America was going to run out of 25 critical uh, minerals. In 1973, people said we'd soon run out of oil. And those predictions have consistently not come true. And I don't think there's any reason to think they'll be more right uh, the next time around. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be cautious. It doesn't mean there aren't a set of important investments in protecting the environment that are well worth making. But we'll be more likely to make those investments if the world grows rapidly than we will if the world grows slowly. Turning uh, less developed countries into natural history parks is not the solution to improving the environment. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the Sustainable Development Commission? Uh, this is a UN agency which is going to watchdog uh, environmental protection uh, around the world. Is, is this a good idea? Clearly, vast mistakes have been made in the past. Clearly, there has been too little sensitivity to environmental concerns as dams have been uh, built, as countries have set their agricultural policies, as cities have, uh, as cities have spread, as w rivers have been used as waste dumps. So I think anything that can raise consciousness and can bring in the environmental aspect into economic decision making is something that has to be applauded. I think there is a danger always that uh, policies will be pursued in the name of sustainability that may seem productive in the short run, but which by slow it, which will slow development and therefore be somewhat counterproductive in the long run, and that would be quite unfortunate. Mm -hmm. You're afraid that this commission may uh, may demand car carbon emissions to the point where economic development is limited. Is that the idea? I am not predicting that the I'm not predicting what the commission will do. If uh, that were to happen, I think it would be very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Now you have written that we were passing from an era uh, in the 1980s of deregulation uh, and uh, smaller government and so on to an era of more regulation and more government involvement, which you seem to applaud. Now, uh, doesn't this suggest that uh, that governments are going to start throttling the kind of development that you're hoping for in order to save lives in the third world? I think there's a lot that governments can do to promote development. Governments have to do more to provide basic infrastructure, to teach children, to provide basic health care, to supervise banks halfway decently in both the developed world and the developing world. So when I said there was a role for increased government, I didn't mean the heavy-handed policies of the past where the government tried to run steel mills. I meant governments need not just to get the laissez-faire spirit, that they need to get out of things, but they need to concentrate on doing the fundamental work of government, providing infrastructure, providing a legal framework, providing basic regulation. They need to do those things better, and that I think increasing emphasis will be placed in both the developed world and, on the, and the developing world on governments trying uh, to do that, on how education can be improved, how health care can be improved, how a better job can be done of regulating uh, financial systems, and you'll see a little more emphasis on that, and I suspect a little bit less emphasis because so much progress has been made on the deregulatory agenda mm -hmm. of the 1980s. Mm -hmm. According to the United Nations, the cost of implementing the Earth Summit agenda would be upwards of $125 billion a year. Maurice Strong thinks it would be money well spent. It's in our interest. It's not a reversion to the old uh, foreign aid syndrome. We've got to look at it in terms of uh, a, an investment in our own environmental security and one which makes good sense for us economically as well. But while the Earth summiteers worry about greenhouse gas and biodiversity, simple poverty remains the number one concern for more than a billion people now living in the underdeveloped world. Two million children die every year because their families don't have access to clean water. 
world population is predicted to double to more than 10 billion by the middle of the 21st century. And 90% of the increase will occur in the developing countries. Helping the third world solve its fundamental economic problems could make a big difference in reducing environmental degradation. The developed nations don't want to talk about uh, uh, opening their markets, letting in more imports from poor countries at a time when many of them are coming out of recession or are still in recession. Uh, they don't want to, the poor nations don't want to talk about population because population is a problem that they're responsible for, that they have rapidly growing populations. The Vatican doesn't want to talk about population, a key issue. So all these other problems are just too complicated to, to uh, politically to deal with in this setting. Global warming seemed to be the one where most of the world, with the U.S. as the exception, was willing to get on board the same boat. The U.S. recession has already caused a ripple effect throughout the third world where many countries depend on exports to the U.S. for foreign exchange. Worldwide economic expansion has slowed in the 1990s to below the average rate for the 1980s. And trade barriers pose another threat to third world development. The World Bank estimates that a successful conclusion to the current global negotiations on trade would increase the export revenues of developing countries by about $50 billion dollars a sum roughly equal to what the developed world pays each year in foreign aid. The potential for a free world trading system to help the poor nations of the South is far more powerful and far more important than any of this talk about global warming or biodiversity. Uh, if you cut uh, trade barriers in half in the rich nations, that would provide $50 billion a year uh, in new exports to the poor nations, and that's, that's very important. Is there a trend toward protectionism in the developed world that is going to make it impossible for the developing world to become prosperous? There's a trend towards protection in the developed world. Most OECD countries have more protection today than they did uh, five years ago. That is a real concern for the developing world that will make it more difficult for developing countries to succeed in the way that Korea or in the way that uh, Thailand have succeeded in the past. But as yet, that protection has not risen to nearly the point uh, where it would make it impossible for developing countries to succeed. And there's still a very strong case for developing countries to open their economies and to pursue a more export-oriented uh, strategy because the real winners in the developing world have been the ones that have concentrated on increasing their exports. Mm -hmm. um, so if GATT fails, and it se does not seem to be, uh, to be doing very well, the negotiations, uh, what is the, the outcome going to be for third world development? The outcome would be uh, very serious. Very serious because an opportunity would be lost. If the GATT treaty is agreed on, it will increase third world export revenues by about $50 billion. That's equal to the world's foreign aid effort. So an opportunity will be lost. And almost certainly uh, there's a bicycle element here where when you stop moving forward, you start to move backwards. And all kinds of protection that has been on hold while the GATT round has been negotiated will be taken off hold, will come forward, and that will make things even more difficult uh, for developing countries. That in turn will discourage foreign investment in developing countries. That will discourage them from liberalizing their economies, and so the consequences for less developed countries are potentially very, very well, do, serious. Do you regard the failure of the GATT agreement uh, as the most serious threat to third world development? I would say that it's the most serious international threat uh, to third world uh, development and the one that is most pressing. Clearly what would be even more serious would be some reversal of the trend towards liberalization uh, that we've seen. Uh, and but that's what third that world, and that's what, uh, and that's what becomes a greater risk if the GATT agreement is not uh, signed. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the establishment of trading blocks? I mean, the, one of the alternatives that's cited if uh, GATT fails is that there will be an Asia block, there'll be a European block, and a North American block, and a South American block joining together the, this hemisphere. Now, is that a bad thing for uh, for the world? I think there should be a strong presumption in favor of reduced trade barriers any way they happen. Best if it happens globally, best if it happens unilaterally, but perfectly all right in most cases 
if it happens on a partial basis between countries in a single region. I don't think there's any question that the EC has contributed to the prosperity of the European countries and probably contributed to the prosperity of the rest of the world as well. And I think a U.S.-Mexico free trade agreement or the expansion of a U.S.-Mexico free trade agreement into Latin America would be in the interests of uh, the United States and in the interests of the countries of Latin America by promoting trade. Better still if it could all be done globally. But uh, where the global process stalls, I think there's a clear case for moving ahead regionally. In the 1980s, the, the world became more committed to the market as a means of development in the, in the third world uh, and the World Bank uh, along with everyone else. Now, is that still the case or is the, is the era over? No question that the commitment to the market is still there. At the World Bank, we speak of the market-friendly uh, strategy where governments stop doing the things that the market can do in order that they can do better the things that only government can do. But those things are very important to development, whether it's education, whether it's providing roads, whether it is health care, or whether it's providing the structure uh, within which the invisible hand can operate, regulating the banks, enforcing contracts. Because if we've learned anything from what's happening in Eastern Europe right now, it's that when you try to operate a system of markets without incentives and plans without controls, what you get is chaos and a lot of pain and suffering. That's not something that can be solved simply by getting the government out of everything. The government's got to provide a framework in which the private sector can operate. Are we in for a period of slow growth in the world, and does that mean that people are going to be poorer? I think there's no question that the next several years are going to be difficult in each of the major uh, economies, each for their own reason. Japan living with the bubble, America working itself out from certain financial difficulties, uh, the European economies uh, dealing with the problem of absorbing the formerly communist uh, economies. Over time, I'm optimistic, though, that the end of the Cold War means we've got a lot of potential for more rapid growth. And no question that the best way to do that is to get budget deficits down, and the place where that's most true is in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, historically, you have been uh, a, a Democrat, even though you're a... You're a um world statesman now. Um, now, your, your views sound more conservative than they did uh, in, in past years. Uh, have you at the World Bank become more of a marketist and, uh, and more of a free trader than you used to be? I don't think so. I've always been a uh, supporter of a relatively open trading system and have always emphasized the important role of uh, government in spurring economic uh, growth and I think that's true in the United States and it's true in the less developed world but one has to be pragmatic and we know that state-run steel companies don't work they don't produce effectively and that's why there's a tidal wave of privatizations from liberal governments from conservative governments all over the world and that's a very good thing but at the same time We've seen the pendulum swing too far, and I think more of the energy in that during the 1990s is going to be in governments doing better, and less of the emphasis is going to be on governments doing less uh, than was true in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Larry Summers, thanks very much for being with us. For American Interests, I'm Morton Kondracki. Get set to take your own journey through the stars. Stay tuned for Jack Horkheimer, the star hustler, following in a moment. This program was produced by the Blackwell Corporation, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for American interests is provided by Maytag Corporation, a family of companies continuing the quality tradition in home appliances and vending products throughout the world.
For a video cassette of American interests, please phone the Blackwell Corporation at area code 202-223-7744. This is PBS. For a transcript of American Interests, send $5 to News Transcripts, Post Office Box 34100, Washington, D.C., 20043. Please specify program topic. How does the American economy look to you? Lousy. Very lousy. Do you think it's going to get better or worse? I hope we'll get better, and I think we'll get better. It, it's supposed to get better. I read about signs of recovery, but I haven't personally seen any. I thought it would be a little easier by now. I did. How's business? Next on Listening to America, Curing the Economy. See it here on Iowa Public Television, Tuesday evening at 9. The next new and live Mark Russell comedy special is coming up on public television. But these are serious times. Everybody is mad about something. In New York City, they trashed a neighborhood bar for having happy hour. In L.A., they put a chokehold on a guy for wearing a smile button. The song Happy Days Are Here Again has been banned for its objectionable lyrics. But if I took everything as seriously as everybody else, I could get sued for malpractice. Wednesday at 7 here on Iowa Public Television. This is Iowa Public Television. Portions of our broadcast day are made possible by grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and Friends of Iowa Public Television. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. Our episode for this week, Monday, June 15th through Sunday, June 21st, is So Long Spring Skies, Hello Summer. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and it's that wonderful time of year again when you can do long and leisurely stargazing without getting chill blades. Indeed, the first day of summer, the summer solstice, occurs this Sunday, the 21st, which means that we have to wait until quite late for it to get dark out to do our stargazing. And in fact, every year at this time of the summer solstice, if you start your stargazing just after it gets good and dark out, you will see a perfect picture in the heavens of spring and summer together. Spring making a grand exit in the west and summer making a grand entrance in the east. Let me show you. Okay, we've got our skies set up for this week and next between 10 and 11 p.m., your local daylight saving time. And if you look just slightly northwest, you should be able to find easy as pie, our old friend, the Big Dipper. Now, we all know that if we take the two stars in the end of the cup, we can shoot an arrow through them. And that arrow will land on the North Star. But did you also know that you can use the two stars in the back of the cup to find two other very important stars? For instance, if we shoot an arrow through these two stars out the bottom of the cup, our arrow will land almost directly on the bright star Regulus in the spring constellation Leo the Lion, which we have been watching all spring long. And appropriately during the last week of every spring, Leo is getting ready to set and leave our evening skies until next spring. But if we take those two same stars in the back of the Dipper's Cup and shoot an imaginary arrow in the other direction, Zingo! It not only points to one bright star, but to an area of three bright stars. The three stars that make up the incredibly brilliant Summer Triangle, which is now rising and making its appearance in the East during this first week of summer. Now, our arrow from the Dipper lands almost smack dab 
on the star Deneb, which is the brightest star, the tail star of Cygnus, the swan. And the slightly brighter star above Cygnus is Vega in Lyra the harp, while the other bright star is Altair in Aquila the eagle. Now, once again, an arrow shot through the two stars in the back of the cup of the dipper out the bottom of the cup will land on springtime's Leo the lion. But that same arrow shot in the opposite direction will land on summer's summer triangle. Nifty, huh? So why not make up your mind now that every year for the rest of your life on one night during the last week of spring or the first week of summer, you will wait until the sun sets and then go outside and contemplate this wonderful celestial farewell to one season and hello to another. Indeed, I can't think of a more fitting and lovely way to celebrate the changing of the seasons. And all you have to do is remember to keep looking up. Educators, science teachers, if you would like a free copy of Star Hustler to use in classrooms and science clubs, contact NASA Corps, 15181 Route 58 South, Oberlin, Ohio, 44074. Star Hustler is brought to you by Sky and Telescope magazine, available in libraries and on newsstands everywhere. If you can't find a copy, dial toll-free 1-800-221-3148 for the location of your nearest distributor. Next time on NOVA. Five years ago, an explosion rocked Chernobyl, covering 20 countries with destructive radiation. Today, scientists race to recover deadly nuclear fuel before it can explode again. Exclusive footage shot deep inside the collapsing tomb follows scientists trying to prevent another catastrophe. It's a suicide mission to Chernobyl. That's next time on NOVA. Tuesday evening at 7 here on Iowa Public Television. This is statewide Iowa Public Television, which is owned and operated by the Iowa Public Broadcasting Board. Our transmitters and translators are located throughout Iowa. KBIN, Channel 32, Council Bluffs. KDIN, Channel 11, Des Moines. KHIN, Channel 36, Red Oak. KIIN, Channel 12, Iowa City, with translators in Ottumwa, Fort Madison, Keokuk, and Keosauqua. KRIN, Channel 32, Waterloo. KSIN, Channel 27, Sioux City, with translators in Rock Rapids and Sibley. KTIN, Channel 21, Fort Dodge. KYIN, Channel 24, Mason City, with translators in Decorah and Lansing. We hope you enjoyed our broadcast day. Good night.